First of all, to Joshua chapter 1. When you get there, I'll have you put your finger, put a marker there, put a dollar bill there, something to mark your place. And then go to Acts chapter 2. Most of you are familiar with both of these passages of Scripture, but I want to take time to at least highlight some of those verses. How many are still hungry for revival? What I want to do this afternoon, and it's I usually like to be a little more preachy in the afternoons after lunch, something to keep people awake. But this afternoon is going to be a little more teachy, teaching oriented. And I'll try to cover as much ground as I can in the uh, 50 minutes that we have. But maybe we'll even leave time at the end to pray. But what I want to do today is to really encourage you about getting ready for revival. Now, we can say we're hungry for revival. We want revival. And I could actually walk into your church and spend a couple of days and find out whether or not you were really expecting revival. If you are expecting revival, then you are preparing for revival. Let me see if I can explain it this way. In fact, preparation is a strong indicator of expectation. What I mean by that is, I lived in Florida. For most of my ministry, I was in Florida. And uh, for the last 10 years of pastoral ministry, I was in a, a place called Inglewood, Florida, right on the Gulf Coast. And there would be these hurricanes. I, I don't know, do you have hurricanes or big storms that come in here? No, you don't have to deal with that. Thank the Lord, you know, for that. Because we would have these big hurricanes come up in the Gulf Coast and they would say, well, it's going to hit here or here or here. And so as they went up the Gulf Coast, they weren't always that accurate. And when there was one that was coming in our general direction, we would have to prepare for that hurricane to get there. So we'd have to board up the windows, make sure everything was that could be blown around was no longer in the yards or in the church. And, and I, I just hated that season because there were times we would board up all the windows of our church and I really didn't think it was going to hit. Now, if I didn't think it was going to come, I was not all that careful about taking care of getting things ready. Now, if I really thought there was a chance that that hurricane was going to hit our church and my home, then I went to an extra, the extra mile to prepare for that. Let me, let me give another example. I'm leaving this afternoon, and you say, Tom, I would love to have you come over for dinner. And I would say something like, well, you know, maybe sometime. When you left and got home, you're not going to make your husband pick up all of his clothes. You're not going to make sure everything's all cleaned up. You're not going to fix a big meal because you're not really expecting me to come. But now if I'm leaving and I say, what time? And you say, well, six o'clock. And I say, okay, I'll be, home. I'll be there at six o'clock. You're going to go home. You're going to make sure everything is cleaned up. You're going to make sure your husband has picked up all of his dirty clothes. You're going to make sure the kids have cleaned up their rooms. And you're going to fix this wonderful, beautiful meal. 
along with a lot of chocolate. How many likes chocolate? I like chocolate. I found out that chocolate is a vegetable. So I try to eat all of my vegetables every opportunity I get. So, and you would make sure there are a lot of vegetables. Code word for chocolate. You'd make sure that is there because you are really expecting me to come. Now, if we really believe that revival is coming to Nigeria, then we're going to prepare for that outpouring to hit our church and hit our community. In other words, we'll do things so that we capture the harvest. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be an awful thing if there was a revival to hit the world and there, it really came to pass, there's some prophetic words that I may read later about there being a billion soul harvest. Wouldn't it be an awful thing if revival came and we didn't have the nets in place to catch the fish that the Lord sent our way? Or we didn't have our tools sharpened to reap the harvest? I, I, there are time, the Lord speaks to me in pictures, and there are times I see these huge, huge fields of wheat standing, and I see the laborers out there just reaping the harvest. And then there are times I see that same field, and they're withering and dying because no one is reaping the harvest. And so one of the, the things that I'm trying to do is encourage churches to encourage the body of Christ to prepare for the revival. Now, if I came to your church, would I see systems in place to disciple new believers? Would I see systems in place to capture the harvest? Or would I see a church going about business as usual? Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. When suddenly a sound like the blowing of a mighty wind came and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. I believe that that is supposed to happen on a regular basis. It's not a one-time experience. There are people who look at Acts chapter 2 and say, well, that was just a one-time experience when I think it's supposed to happen on a regular basis. I think we're supposed to have that kind of outpouring. See, that for me is a, symbolizes a, a, a revival, a perfect revival that took place. In fact, Bill Johnson says that the upper room is the one, one service that the Lord had fully control of. And if you read Acts chapter 2, you're going to find that there were the disciples who praised. In fact, and you can read the verses there uh, down to verse 12. And the disciples were excited about what happened. But look in verse 12. Amazed and perplexed. So when revival comes, you're going to have those who are excited. Then you're going to have some people who are amazed. And, and not really understanding what's going on. And then you find in verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said they had too much wine. You'll have those in revival that are what I would call the scoffers. They will make fun of it. They don't believe it's of God. Now, I, I don't know the culture of Nigeria enough. I, I don't know if you... If you wrestle with some of the issues we do with, uh, that we wrestle with in America, because in my country, there are a lot of churches and pastors that criticize the kind of thing that we experienced here this morning. Now, again, I don't know. Maybe everybody in Nigeria loves what they saw this morning. No? Okay. All right. So you have some of those same issues. But we have churches that are pastors leading a uh, uh, leading pastors in our in our nation that were very critical of what God did in Toronto with Randy and John Arnott and all the others. And, and people, see, when, when the Holy Spirit comes, when revival comes, you're going to find that there are people who object to it. Now, the question I would ask this afternoon is, are we more concerned about having Him in our churches 
Are we more concerned about that than we are the opinion and the objectives, objections of others that are around us? Because there will be objections to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and they're, I'm sort, of, I'm sort of off topic, but I think it's important to say, you'll find that there are people who criticize what is going on in your church. They'll do it out of ignorance. Um, they, they just don't know that there's something better. And in fact, what I find is there are like three groups of people. Those who are ready to jump on board, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. They're just ready to jump on. And then you will find there are those that even if Jesus appeared in their service on Sunday morning, they would say, sit on the back row and be quiet. You're not going to be able to convince them no matter what. They're just, they would think we're having a mass hallucination or something because they don't have a parent, they don't have a, a way of thinking that would be accept, that would accept a, a, a visitation like that. But there's a large group of people in the middle it, it, they want it, they're open to it, they just don't want to be deceived. They're, they're afraid of being led away by emotionalism or by deception. Now they're open to it. Maybe this morning, because uh, I, I, when, when it gets a little wild, I look around to see how people are responding. And so maybe there were here some here this morning that were saying, you know, I want this, but I'm not really sure that I want that. I mean, that was the way I used to be. Lord, I want more of you as long as I don't have to fall to the floor and roll around. Come, but come on my terms. And so maybe we had some of that this morning. So there's this large group of people that are open. They just don't want to be led astray. They don't want to be deceived by false doctrine. So there are people who uh, respond to revival and they object to it because they just don't know any better. And then there are some who uh, reject revival are critical of what you would see happening here because they would say it's just too excessive. There's, it's, it's too emotional. I used to fit into that category. It just, it was excessive. They wouldn't say it's not God. They would just say it was excessive. And then you would have a group that might even say it's demonic. They would look and say all oh, that that was going on, that's demonic. We have actually had people say that what happened in Toronto and other revivals in America that it was demonic. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. It's just not recent revivals. Uh, there was someone who said about Azusa Street and Pentecost that came after that, which most of us are, would associate with the Pentecostal outpouring. They would say it was the last vomit of Satan. They would say it was that demonic. When I was a teenager, it was about 18. I, I'd gone away to the punk. I think 17, I'd gone away to the University of South Carolina to be an engineer. And I came home, for, for reasons I won't go into, uh, I came home to date a girl, and uh, she wouldn't date me unless I went to church with her. Because she had gotten saved while I was gone, filled with the Holy Spirit, but she was going to my little small country church. So I thought, okay, I can do that. So I went to the church, eventually gave my heart to the Lord, and uh, at, at that meeting, and left school to go into ministry. But this revival that broke out in my little small country church was really among the young people. And we had a young girl who came and she filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, excited about God. And she had, she was two years younger than I was. And she had this long, beautiful black hair. And when her mother found out that she was going to this church, she said, they are deceiving you they have this magical powder under their sleeve, and when they pray for you, they throw this powder on you, and it makes you act like that. And she said, it's demonic, and if you go back to that church, I will cut all of your hair off. She didn't go back to church, but I found out about four or five years later that when she got away from home, she went into Satanism. Her mother caused her to reject the truth but she still wanted this experience, and so what she did is she swung the other way and got involved in Satanism, worshiping Satan. So there are some people who think that what we're experiencing is, is demonic. And then there are others that, that it just doesn't look like it used to look. Now, I, I don't want to tell you my whole story, but I struggled with revival. When, it, when I started seeing all of this stuff, I, 
I didn't like manifestations. I, I do now, but I didn't when it all happened for me. I, I just didn't. I thought, why would people do that? Because when the Lord would touch me, I would go over in the corner and lay it behind this, these plants we had on the stage. I'd lay there and just some tears. That was the way God touched me. So I thought he ought to touch everybody else like that. And there were people in my church that were doing all these kinds of wild things because I revival had hit, renewal had hit up hit, and I'd taken them to Toronto and taken them to other places for revival. And so they would come back and all this wild stuff would take place in my church. People going, oh, laughing, doing all kinds of things. And so I'm looking at it one day, and I, I mean, it's Sunday morning, it's my church. And it's just, it was a wild Sunday morning. We'd just gotten back from Toronto. And I said, Lord, I don't believe everything I'm seeing is of you. And the Lord whispered in my ear, that inward audible voice, he said, you're right. Everything you see is not of me, but you be careful of plucking it up too quickly because you don't always know the difference. And at that moment, I sort of, I took a deep breath. I went, you know, if the Lord is okay with a little bit of excess, maybe I can relax and be okay as well. It's easier to steer a moving vehicle. Indian day, that means do you understand in Portuguese? If, if, you're, if you've got a vehicle that's moving, going somewhere, it's easy to turn it. But when people, when the car is just stopped, dead still, it's hard to turn that way. And that's the way people are. Some people sit on the pew and criticize what God is doing and they're going nowhere. When those who may be a little emotional, at least God can direct their emotionalism. Now, by the way, I am not saying, if you're a pastor, I'm not saying you don't learn to pastor revival. My wife and I learned over years how to pastor the renewal, how to pastor people when there was excess, and we had it. But at first, I didn't always know the difference. So when revival comes and you see things that are going on that you're not all that happy about because it doesn't look like what you experienced, then give the Lord a chance to help correct you without judging everything that you see. In fact, the whole... The whole revival, renewal movement was a struggle to me. I would go to Toronto. I knew God was there. The first time I walked into the building in Toronto, I just broke into tears. There was no one in the building, but a few people setting up. I'd taken my staff, I'd walked, I walked in the building, and I just, I just felt the presence of God. I wish everybody could have at least sensed what was going on at that point in time. And I just began, began to weep. I knew God was there, but when the service started, I mean, it was just chaos. People laughing. I couldn't hear the speakers sometimes. They were laughing too loud. I didn't like the laughter, by the way. That was the manifestation. I, I, I was more okay with you shaking and falling than I was the laughter. I, I didn't like the laughter. Got to move on. But the Lord really taught me a lesson about about where I was through through laughter because I rejected it. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the Lord speaks to me in pictures, one of the ways he speaks to me, and he showed me this long dock out into the middle of the river. And Jesus is on the edge of the dock this, the, that goes in the river. And he's got me in his arms. And he is, I'm kicking and screaming like a three-year-old, but Jesus is laughing. So he walks out to the end of the dock and he throws me into the river. And then the Lord said, you came kicking and screaming, but I still got you into the middle of the river. And some of you may be wanting in the river and he is dragging you kicking and screaming because you're saying, it doesn't look the way I think it ought to look. That's okay. Get over it. Let him do it the way he wants to do it. And as I mentioned yesterday, it may not look like Toronto. It may not look like Pensacola, if any of you went to the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, Pensacola, Florida. It may not look like that. So as there was in the book of Acts, the same is true of revivals today. There are people who look at it and criticize it. I, I, I mentioned again yesterday that I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading on revivals. And if you go back to the days of, of Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, the 
great revivalist in, at least for my country, and you look at Finney and others, people would come and criticize what God was doing. Now the thing that I really like is some of their stories where someone would come drunk to make fun, they'd be under the influence of alcohol, they would come to make fun of what was going on in the particular revival service, and God would hit them, and they would start doing the same manifestations. I could, I could go in some of the manifestations, but I, I won't. But, so just be careful. If you criticize something, that may be the very thing that the Lord hits you with. Is there any kind of a manifestation that you don't particularly like? Lord, get up with that one. All right, I've got to hurry. But okay, laughter was my big problem. I, I did like the laughter. I remember the first time somebody broke out into holy laughter in my church. We were building a building, and we had government officials visiting my church on a Sunday night. And they're sitting there, and I'm thinking, Lord, let everything go perfect tonight. So here I am, and Charlie, Markham, a good friend, one of my elders, that is the night that he decides to laugh. And he starts laughing, he runs down, he falls on the floor in the front, and, I, and I'm not excited about it, I'm getting very angry. Because I've got these people here from the government, from the county, what our way we've broken up, and he's going to pitch this laughing fit then. No one had ever really laughed in my church. So we had double doors, three double doors. He, Charlie went out that side, and I went out that, the middle doors, and I caught him, and I said, Charlie, we don't do that here. And he was very honoring. He said, thank you, Pastor. I understand. I won't do that anymore. I'll, basically, I'll quench the Holy Spirit. I, I, I won't do that anymore. And I realized later that I was saying, Charlie, it's okay to come and be sad and depressed, but just don't come and laugh in the church. I'm in Toronto, and guess what hits me? while I'm there. I'm really off topic now, but it, it was the laughter. See, I went through this period, and I may, may share this tomorrow, of where I did not see my, the promises of God for my life coming to pass. I, I just didn't see them happening. And so I am in the back in Toronto getting prayer, and I end up laying on the floor and just... I'm, and as I'm laying there, the Lord begins to remind me of the things that he was going to do in my life and my, in my life. And I just shook my head and I said, no, Lord, I'm not going to go there again. I really wasn't sure it was the Lord. And so I got up off the floor and I'm going back to, to my seat. Now, I, I have been for years trying to get one of the main speakers to lay hands on me. Do you ever do that? Yeah, you do. I've seen you. I, I would go to Toronto. I would go to Brownsville, to Pensacola, and I would try to maneuver where they were going to be because they, you would have these big lines. And so I would try to get in the line of that person, the main speaker. But they would go down the line, they'd be praying, they'd get to me and they'd go to another direction. <laughs> or they would get almost to me and this person, this assistant, like Charity, would come, blame her, come and pull them away. And, and it became a joke with my friends. They said, you must have written on your forehead, do not lay hands on it. I'm not kidding you. I've actually had them skip me. They feel, feel, pray, and then skip me and go to somebody else. And so I, I, well, I always had prayer from, you know, the, just the ministry team, but no one, and I knew Randy for years. He never prayed for me. I, he didn't know who I was, but I was trying to be, I, I would honestly watch. Before I go get in line, okay, John and Carol are, on my, are over there. So I go get in their line. They never got to me. But this particular day, I'm headed to my seat, and this lady taps me on the shoulder and says, come with me, Carol or not wants to pray for you. And she's like from here, oh, to the, that, the camera boom there, away. But for some reason, she spotted me and sent her assistant to call me. And I thought, oh, this is great. Finally, somebody recognizes someone who wants an anointing. So I go over to her. And now before when they prayed for me, I did this little nice little swoon. 
it was almost like a courtesy draw. You know? I, but when I get to her, she reaches out, puts her hand on my forehead, and I hit the floor. It wasn't a little courtesy drop. It wasn't a swoon. I'm in the floor, and she starts praying for me, and she does it this way. She puts her foot in the middle of my chest. And that's how she's praying for me. Now, when I was laying on the floor about five minutes before that, and I said, Lord, if these things are from you that you're saying to me, give me a sign. Here I am in the floor, and she's got her foot on top of me. And then all of a sudden, I felt it right here. The next thing I know, I am laughing, this gut-wrenching laughter from here. And I'm rocking back and forth on the floor. And I'm just laughing my head off. And I'm thinking, this is not me. This is not me. But I rock back and forth. And I, I don't know where Holy Roller came from. But I'm rocking back and forth. And I'm just laughing, laughing. And all of a sudden, it lifts. And I hear the voice of the Lord that says, the very thing that you have despised has now become a sign to you. I'm going to do what I promised I would do. And so I had despised the laughter. I don't anymore. But I, I've never had the laughter hit me like that. But I, I learned right then that the Lord can use the very thing that you despise to be assigned to you. And it was only a few months after that that I met Randy. And then for me, the rest is history. But he used something that I was rejecting. Is there something about revival that turns you off? Maybe rethink it. It might be the thing that he's wanting to make a point in your life through. So that was a long, long roundabout way to get to Joshua chapter 1. Preparing for, for revival. How many would like an Acts chapter 2 to happen tonight when Blaine is speaking? Well, I, I just think it would be the greatest service to look around and see everybody with a little flame over their head. Some are saying, never happened. Well, why not here? And why not me? Do we have any volunteers for the fire tonight? All right. Okay, let me get to my subject. Sorry, that was fun anyway. Joshua chapter 1. And this actually seems like a strange place to go to talk about revival. And I, what I want to do is pull some thoughts uh, and go as long as I can go. Actually, it's about learning preparation for revival from Joshua. And I want to read, and by the way, I, I think we have Joshua's in this building today. I look around and I, I do see some older people, my age, 35 and 40, just seeing if you're paying attention. Um, I think with this revival that we're beginning to experience, this new wave, this tsunami wave of the Spirit that's coming, and I, I believe it is a tsunami wave, and do you know how tsunami waves, many of them begin? Earthquakes out in the ocean deep into the ocean that no one sees, there's a shift in the seafloor. There's a seismic shift. There's something that takes place and it creates this next wave. Just keep in mind that it may be what you do in secret that causes the next tsunami wave to take place. If you read the history of revivals, at least in my country, many of them started with people praying in a room somewhere months and months and sometimes even years for revival to come. We think it was the main evangelist standing on the stage, but it was really God answering the prayers of gray-haired grandmothers and granddads who were in their secret place crying out for revival to hit for their children and their grandchildren. So you may be the one that's that seismic, that's, that's doing something in the secret, hidden. And I believe the Lord wants to use the older generation when this revival comes. We always talk about it. I do the same thing. I, I have altar calls for the 30-year-olds 30 30 year and under. I, I had one woman who came to me. Uh, she's got tears in her eyes. She said, I'm 31. Can I still get in? I said, yes, you can get in. I think the Lord will touch 31-year-olds as well. But we focus a lot of times on the young people, and we should. But the older group as well, 
those of us who are in our 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, I believe God wants to use them to be the mothers and the fathers of those that are raised up for, for revival. We need mothers and fathers that will help mature and disciple and mentor and take care of the generation that's much younger. Bob Jones, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he uh, was a famous prophetic voice in our country. He had a prophecy. He said the over 50s should get a vision as fathers, mothers, grandfathers, and grandmothers. They need to keep in mind that life does not end at 50, but just begins. And that should cause someone to say hallelujah, that if it begins at 50, he said they should keep in mind that they are setting the stage for the next great wave of revival. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them now. He is waiting for the Joshua's to get in line. Joshua was not a young man when he took Israel into the promised land. And then he asked, do we have any Joshua's? I ask the same thing. Do we have any Joshua's today that's willing to mentor a new generation that's coming up? Seven of you. Okay. If, if, if they aren't mentored, if they're not discipled and trained, they can actually kill revival. See if I can explain this well. The first group in the you know, 1990s that were part of Toronto, those that got touched by revival, many of them had very solid biblical, uh, uh, had a solid biblical or theological foundation. Before revival, yet they'd gone to Bible school, they'd studied, they knew the word, they understood uh, what was of God and what was not of God. And so they jumped in and they were able to lead. But then we had the spiritual sons and spiritual grandchildren coming up that didn't have that same uh, theological or biblical foundation and they would jump in and we get reports of them teaching things that's not biblical. They, they need to be discipled. See, you might have the power, but you also need to have an understanding of the scripture. One of the greatest healing evangelists in America in the 40s was William Branham. Anybody heard of William Branham? Any of you? Okay. He, he was anointed. God called him. He had a divine encounter with an angel in a cave. God was using some of the greatest miracles that you can read about. God was using him. But in the latter years of his life, he began to teach things that really, they were heresy. And he went away from, from teaching the truth. I think he was going to heaven. I, he didn't do it intentionally, but just didn't. He should have left the theology to those who understood the, the biblical part of it. And he should have just walked in his anointing. Anointing, at least that's my opinion. So we need the older group. And please hear my heart. And it's not just because I'm one of the older group now. I think we need you that have a little more maturity and, a little, and you have a little more experience to help nurture and guide those who are younger. Now, not criticize them for their enthusiasm. Don't criticize them. Don't guide them. Don't throw a water. Don't throw water on the, the flame that's there. And don't, don't restrict them in the sense of making them lose that passion, but guide that passion and help them have a, an understanding of the word. I, I believe in the spirit, and I also believe in the word. I think you need both. All right, let me move on. Back to my subject. All right, I'm going to run through a couple of things that we should keep in mind if we want to prepare uh, for revival coming. Let me get back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. Okay, number one is celebrate the past, but don't live there. Don't build a monument to it. Celebrate the past, but don't, don't live there. Now, this may seem like a minor point, but it really is very significant. It's very important because the past often keeps people from moving into the present of what God is doing. In other words, the cloud has moved, but the people didn't move with it. There are whole denominations that were holding on to what God did to the point that they were unable to accept Toronto and the fresh outpouring, uh, outpouring and they're unable to accept today. And you may know churches like this. 
They're holding on to what God did, and they can't accept what God is doing. Celebrate the past, but don't live there. It's five simple words. After, let me read verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. This is what the Lord said. Five words. Moses, my servant, is dead. Five simple words, but five words that are packed with meaning. Well, what is the Lord trying to say there? I think it implies the closing of one chapter in Israel's history and the beginning of a new. I, I think it was like the turning of a page in their life. It was, it was a time to move from where they were and to move into what God had for them. Now, I, 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 I please honor your heritage. I, I do my heritage. I honor where I came from. I'm indebted to what I was taught at a younger, younger age. But my denomination rejected Toronto. They were not open to it. They didn't accept the new thing that, was, that God was doing. So what I'm, I'm asking for us to do is to honor, celebrate the past. Don't get locked into where you were. That means don't let the failures of your past define where you're going. See, failures are the scars that reveal where you've been. They don't have to define where you're going. Whatever the failure was in your life, acknowledge that it was there, but now you're moving forward. And so that's what I think the Lord is saying to them. And move on, learn from your mistakes. And I think Israel, Israel did. And take encouragement from the way that God has operated in the past. See, we can look back. I can look back at my heritage and see where God operated in a powerful way. My, my denomination has always believed in healing. From its very inception, it actually had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit before Azusa Street, like two years before Azusa Street, in the mountains and the hills of, of Tennessee and North Carolina. And so we've always believed in, in healing. And so I look back and I take encouragement from what God did. I honor what he did, but I'm not going to live there. The second one is found in verses 2 through 4. Regularly remind yourself of the promise and the prophecies of revival for your nation. I, I, I don't know what they are. I, I know what they are for America. And there are promises and prophetic words about revival coming uh, during our time. Whatever they are, remind yourself of them. Starting with verse 2, let me through, read through verse 4. Now then... Still in Joshua chapter 1, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. Now listen to the promise. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great, great sea on the west. Now this was not the first time that they were they heard this promise. They, all of their lives they grew up with these promises. For hundreds of years Israel had heard the promise. But now the Lord is restating the promise. And, and you, one of the things I encourage you to do is whatever the promise of God for your nation, for your church, for your life, whatever it is, pray over it. Proclaim it. Declare it. Pray into it. Restate. When you start talking about the promises for your nation, it creates a sense of anticipation of what God is going to do. It, it's a reminder of what He said. And whatever He said He would do, He's going to do. Let's try it on the left. Whatever God said He was going to do, He will do. I understand that sometimes, well, when, when man prophesies it and we think it's God, he's not obligated to make that come to pass. But if he is declared, and there are ways, I have a, a teaching in the back about uh, prophecy and the balance of it, but whatever he has said, he's going to be true to. And I, 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 I wish I knew, I, I like to try to find out what God is saying to a nation in the area of revival. You can already see the revival is a passion of mine. And whatever he has said, he is going to do. 
What, what has he promised you about Nigeria? What has he promised you about, I know other nations here in Plasma as well, other, other cities. Uh, what has he promised you about Lagos? See, I don't, I don't know that Femi would go to the effort and the expense of doing something like this if he didn't feel in his heart that the Lord has spoken something for this nation. I, I could spend the next 30 minutes talking about the faithfulness of God and how Israel, they neglected to remember how faithful God had been. See, even when they were about to go in and possess the promised land and they were afraid of the fortified cities and the giants, God had just parted the Red Sea for them. He had just delivered them from Pharaoh's army. He had miraculously taken them out of bondage and set them free. But in that short span of time, they had already forgotten what God, had, what God did and because they were facing another problem, another challenge. It's important as you go forward, forward to remember how faithful God really is. What is he saying? What has he said to you? Whatever it is, he's going to be faithful to it. Continue to state it. it it's, it's important that if you're a pastor to keep before the people what God has said is going to happen to your church, to your ministry, and to the influence that you're going to have. I, I, one of the things that I, I tried to do as a pastor was to keep the vision before the people. And, and maybe I'll talk about it tomorrow morning, but the Lord has a prophetic promise, a destiny over every person that's here. I actually think that destiny, that revival is a part of every person's destiny. Just my fault. I don't, I, again, I don't know the history, but has Nigeria ever had a nationwide revival that just swept through the country? Have, let it happen again, Lord. All right, the other four major points, five major points, we'll wait. Uh, and let me get to one of the last ones. So Joshua, this is verse 10, ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. See, Joshua was telling the people to make practical preparations to go in and possess the land that God had promised them. My emphasis, if I would have gotten there, would have been to say to you as churches, as Christians, as the body of Christ, make practical preparations for the promise of God. If we believe revival is coming, then we need to make preparations for it. Put things, put systems in place to reap the harvest, disciple the harvest. Here are the prophetic words that have come, and they affect not only the U.S., but the world. William Seymour of Azusa Street, remember who he was. He prophesied in 1910 that another great spiritual outpouring would sweep the earth in about 100 years. Charles Parham, uh, another Pentecostal uh, revival leader, said he prophesied a great move of God happening in about 100 years. Smith Wigglesworth, 30 years after Parham and Seymour's prophecy, he spoke of a revival coming as never before. He saw multitudes upon multitudes being saved Diseases of all kinds falling before the power of the Lord and dead being raised back to life. I think we're seeing the beginnings of what Smith Wigglesworth saw. I, and I think it's just the first fruits. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Cru Crusade for Christ, a great man, but you wouldn't really confuse him as a Pentecostal. But toward the end of his life, he stated that the Lord revealed to him there was coming a great harvest of a billion souls. Now, that's a bigger number than I can imagine. I'm trying to think how long it would take to spend a billion dollars. My wife wouldn't have any trouble. Bob Jones, the In, 
Bob Jones. He said, in God's line stood maybe 2% of humanity. He then heard the words, I am going to bring a billion souls unto myself in one great way. Stacy Campbell, prophetically. She saw a billion soul formation that looked like a million stones of all different kinds, sizes, ages, shapes, all fitting together in a new mountain center of Jesus. She said the harvest is so big it cannot be contained in one structure. And my question is, is the church ready for that kind of harvest? You might say, well, Tom, do you really believe that? Well, I don't know if it's going to be a billion, but I'm okay if it's 399,999,999. If it misses a billion by one, I'm okay with that. I think the Lord was speaking of a great harvest that's going to come. Now, if we really had a billion soul harvest, what would we do with all the people? Here's what it would take, and then I'm going to pray. One million souls are roughly equal to 15% of the world's population. The whole world. This means we need to prepare for 15% of our cities to come in to Jesus in the next decade. It will take 10 million new pastors to care for 1 billion souls on a 1 to 100 uh, ratio. 10 million new pastors. Some of you might be called to today. In fact, I'm sure some. This means we will need 1,000 colleges graduating 1,000 pastoral leaders per year for the next 10 years. Are we ready? Are we prepared for the harvest? I mean, are we prepared even for a harvest of pathway? I think, we, and, and I think we need to be intentional in the way we look. If we really expect, if it's more than just rhetoric, if it's just more than more preacher talk, if it's more than just trying to work up emotion, if we really believe that there's going to be this kind of a revival in our lifetime, we would be getting ready for it, or we will be stewards that the Lord is displeased with because we weren't ready for what He was doing. I, I, am, I no longer, I don't have a hope for this next wave. I know the next wave is coming. I, I, just, I don't just, for me, it's not, I think it's coming, I wish it would come, I hope it's come. For whatever reason, I, 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 I know. And this is going to sound a little bit silly, but there have been times on airplanes, and I, I fly a lot, I, I do a lot of travel. I think this year, depending on what happens in the next several months, about 220, 230 days, so I fly a lot. I just became a two million miler on Delta. And there have been times I've been on planes when the weather was not what I would really prefer. I like the smooth sailing. But when you're doing this, it's not my favorite thing to do. Although I was a student pilot, I flipped the plane upside down one time by accident. Sorry for another time, but I scared myself and the, the, the pilot next to me, the trainer, I scared both of us to death. But I accidentally flipped it upside down. There have been times I've been on planes and it would be a little rough and I think, you know, it's all going to be okay because I haven't seen what I think I'm supposed to see. So, it's not my time to die yet. I wanted to stand up and say to everybody, okay, everybody, it's going to be all right. It's not my time yet. I'll have to get off the plane if it's going to crash. I, I really, with everything within me, believe that whether I see the total fulfillment of that wave, I believe I'm going to see at least the beginnings. The Lord said, prepare yourself to catch the next wave. And I do what I do because I want to be in the middle of what God does in our time. I hope your heart is in the same place. And it will take unity. One of the things that, you know, Joshua required, and I don't have time to develop it, I'm over time is he brought all the tribes together, even the ones that were staying on the other side. It is time for churches in America, it's time for churches and leaders in Nigeria, it's time for churches and leaders in the body of Christ to focus on building the kingdom of God and not their own kingdom. It, it is time for us to set aside our agendas and say, 
Lord, as the body of Christ, what is your agenda? It's, it's, it's time for us to be able to work with others that we don't see eye to eye on every point of doctrine. Now, I shouldn't quit there because some of you might misunderstand it, but there are, there are core, core beliefs about the kingdom that everybody must believe they're going to be in the body of Christ. There's a core. But the further we get from that core, the less important that they are. And we fight. Most of us fight not over these things. We fight over these things out here that are not central to the gospel. And so I'm saying we may need to set some things aside and say, I understand, brother, sister, you believe that, that's fine. Feel free to believe it. I don't mind that you're wrong. Just feel free to believe it. But I'm going to love you anyway, and we're going to participate in bringing a fresh harvest into the storehouses of the Lord. Would you stand? Wow. Why not here? And why not me? Let's raise our hands to the Lord together. Lord, we, we volunteer. You don't have to draft us. We are saying yes to you. We're ready. We want to participate. We're going to focus on your agenda, which is seeing the kingdom of God advance. And Lord, we're going to think, what part do you want me to play in preparing the body of Christ for the harvest that's coming? See, every church can't do everything, but you can do your part. So Lord, we volunteer to do our part. And I ask that Lord, today there will be those who are called to be missionaries. They're called to be pastors. They're called to be teachers. They're called to be evangelists. They're called to be apostles. They're called to be prayer warriors. Lord, they're called to be people who just love their neighbor. I pray that today will be a day of calling in this group of people, Lord. Can we just give the Lord a big clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord.